Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to this great online event. We are here tonight at the University of California Merced. Thank you so much for joining us for the Return to Campus in Fall 2021 Town Hall. Thank you so much once again for joining us. My name is Ricky Hill, and I'm an e-recruiter here at UC Merced. Before we get started, let me go ahead and give you a couple of quick tips. If you need to adjust your audio settings, you can do so in the lower left corner of your screen by clicking the audio settings button. If you would like to adjust the size of your window, click on view options in the upper portion of your screen. Lastly, and most importantly, this event has been specially designed just for you. We are here to share great information and updates with you, but we also have an opportunity for live question and answers tonight. Please take advantage of the Q&A button in the lower portion of your screen. You can send in those questions. We will get to those throughout the presentation, as well as behind the scenes. We are fully staffed with a great variety of campus partners across our campus. So please send us those questions. And as I said, we will also have an opportunity for live answering of those questions towards the end of this program. Once again, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Ricky Hill. And at this time, it is my great pleasure to hand things over to our Executive Vice Chancellor. Greg Campfield. Good evening, folks. As Ricky said, I'm the executive vice chancellor. What that means is that it's my responsibility to make sure that everything that happens in the classrooms and laboratories um, is humming along really well. And you'll see with me tonight, um, the vice chancellor for student affairs, Charles Neese. And on traditional campuses, the student affairs, Division works with uh, students outside of the classroom and academic affairs works with them inside the classroom. But Charles and I um, know full well that the way students learn is not easily separated into those two boxes. That what happens outside the classroom helps what happens inside and vice versa. So he and I are, are strong partners in making sure that every student on our campus is um, afforded a full education in both the classroom and outside. And that's one of the reasons why we are very excited to say that we are coming back in person in every one of our classes and every one of our residence halls in all of our activities, full blast, we are back. This is return to campus, um, but it's return to campus in a, in a strange way that those people who have been here before are returning to a campus unlike the one that you saw when you left. The 2020 project is finished. We have added many new residence halls. We have added new classrooms. We have added new research facilities. The kinds of hands-on experience that we're known for now have better facilities than ever. Now, I wanna say that um, this has been a very, very difficult year plus now. Um, this pandemic is frightening. It's been challenging. It has um, hurt us all in a multitude of ways that I don't need to go into. Each of you has had your own experiences. But I wanted to say that I am the parent of a student who's going back for his final year in college. And so one of the things that I think about when I'm thinking about opening this campus for, for all of the young people who will be here is, is this a place I would want my son? And the answer is absolutely yes. Um, the way we have approached this is consistent with the way we approached moving to remote instruction when the pandemic first began. That is to say, we are part of the University of California, one of the most powerful research university systems in the world. And we have some of the world's best epidemiologists and best scientists who can um, teach us how to stay as safe as possible from any disease. And we have been in constant consultation throughout the system with these colleagues about what the conditions that would be most safe for uh, return to campus. Now we did have a number of students who lived on campus this last year, a fairly small number, but it was um, plenty enough to teach us what we needed to do to make sure everything was, um, was as safe as possible. And that was in the middle of the pandemic before the vaccines came out. Now, one of the great advantages we have on this campus is that every building is new, 15 years old at most, which means that we have state-of-the-art ventilation systems in every building. Now, campuses that don't have this kind of ventilation 
um, have some concerns about bringing students into, say, a large lecture hall that we don't have. Our ventilation systems have excellent filtration. When the fires were breaking out a few years back and some of the other campuses had to shut down because the air quality was poor, we kept telling our students, stay inside. The air is good in our buildings. We can keep going. Just don't go outside. And it was true. You didn't smell the smoke when you were in our buildings. The filtration systems are that good. Plenty good enough to take care of this virus, to remove it from, from the atmosphere. So it's not um, as big a problem for us as it is for some other campuses because of our new physical plant. Now, that's not to say that's the only thing we're doing to keep people safe. The University of California system expects to mandate vaccines. Um, that will be done as soon as one of the vaccines has received regular authorization instead of emergency authorization. We expect that fairly soon. One of them has been submitted for full authorization. Now, that's not to say everybody, because we have a mandate, that there aren't exceptions to be made. We know that some people have um, physical conditions that preclude their vaccination, and we will certainly accommodate uh, those situations. But we do know these vaccines are incredibly safe and incredibly effective. And so vaccination is another one of our frontline safety mechanisms. Um, we don't yet know for sure all of the safety protocols we'll have to take. Those things are in flux. I'm sure you follow the news and heard that the CDC recently, the Centers for Disease Control, um, recently changed their guidance, the federal guidance, on masks for uh, people who've been vaccinated. Um, we will follow the best science and we will keep everybody up to date on when um, these mandates will change, if they change. But again, we are committed to following the best science and that science is designed um, by definition, the way we ask the questions around safety to make sure that, that um, we are as safe as possible. Our goal is to make it a lot safer to be on campus than to be driving in your car. And I, that's a completely realistic goal at this point. Um, now, what else? Obviously, if someone does get sick, we have the capacity to take care of them through our student health services and also to make sure that we isolate that person so that person doesn't spread the virus further. And this is what we've been doing this past year with, as I said, our small number of students. Um, but there's no question that that will be um, something that we can manage because, as I say, we've tried it already and it's very effective. Now, as for the classes themselves, um, we expect to be fully in person. We do not expect to have to have um, limited uh, occupancy in any of our rooms. There may be a few if the rules stay as stringent as they are right now that we um, won't be able to use, but at most it's three or four of our classrooms, um, again, because of, of the newness of our buildings. Um, it's also really important that we have the kinds of access to hands-on work that we're known for. And again, all of that will be up and running. All of our engineering students in the maker labs, the machine shops, all of our bioscience students in the labs, our field work students, our social science students who are out in the communities, all the kinds of research that we are known for, for undergraduates as well as graduate students will be fully running. Now, what if something changes? Um, we can shift, we know we can shift. We have contingency plans in place. If we have to go to some hybrid mode, um, that is uh, unlikely as we see it at this point, but we are certainly going to continue to follow the best science. Now, I'd like to turn this over to my colleague, Charles Neese, to talk more about the student affairs side and the kinds of extracurricular, as they used to be called, now we call them co-curricular or co-learning experiences that we'll be um, engaged in. Charles? Fantastic. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Kempfield. And, and super excited to be with you all. Thanks for joining us tonight. We've got, we've got a great crowd. Uh, which is awesome. And as you can tell, I'm on campus. Uh, we're back here. We're here. We're ready for you. Uh, and we're super excited about it, uh, that, that the campus is, is, is getting ready and we are looking forward to your return. Uh, as, as the provost mentioned, we've had students who've lived on campus throughout this past year. We've had staff that have been on campus this entire time, uh, making sure we are serving those students and serving those needs. Um, but that doesn't mean we're, we're completely uh, back right now, um, but we're gearing up. 
Uh, and as was mentioned, we are getting ready for you all to return in August uh, for that fully in-person instruction. You know, I've, I've recently had some opportunities to interact with various student groups uh, throughout the past week. Uh, and I've, I've asked them lots of questions about what are you most looking forward to in the fall? Uh, and, and almost to a student, uh, they talked about, I can't wait to interact with my peers and my faculty member as we walk out of the classroom. I've always got questions and I don't know how to get them answered when you hang up a Zoom call. Uh, and I can't wait for my learning to be back in person. I can't wait to hang out in the lantern and just have fun with my friends. I, I, I can't wait to table on Scholars Lane with my clubs and my organizations and meet students as they walk up and down the hallway. I, I had one student who even said, I can't wait to get in an elevator again uh, and just meet some random person that I haven't met yet because that hasn't happened for a whole year. And so many of our students who have been on campus in the past are going to be returning to campus are looking forward to that spirit of community that really is part of the heart and soul of UC Merced and that overall educational journey that you connect with. And we know that many of you on this call will be coming back to campus uh, and, and returning to campus. And as I mentioned, we've got a lot of new spaces. So even for you that have been on campus already, you're gonna see some new stuff. Uh, and we're super excited to show that off. We also know that many of you, about half of our, new, our students, uh, will never have had a course on campus yet as they step foot on campus in August, sometimes for the first time. Uh, and so we're super excited as we think about the opportunities for you all to engage in this learning environment and the spirit of community that really is at the heart and soul of UC Merced. And, what, uh, and like I said, as I've interacted with so many of our scholars over the past week, uh, they all keep telling me, I can't wait, I can't wait, I can't wait. And as the provost mentioned, we are doing a lot of things from that health standpoint to really mitigate the impact that COVID-19 might have. Right, all the way from that, the preparedness that he talked about uh, from vaccinations. And, uh, and we will continue, we do vaccinations on campus and we'll continue to do them throughout the summer. If you are near another UC campus and you're looking for a place to get a vaccine, know that other UC campuses are vaccinating UC students um, across the system. And so if, if you are down in San Diego and you're looking for a vaccine, call UC San Diego, they'll get you in. Uh, they'll get you vaccinated. And so uh, that is part of the preparedness that we're doing. He mentioned the filtration system. He mentioned looking at guidance from the Centers for Disease Control around uh, face covering. So all of that is part of the work that we are doing to mitigate uh, the potential impact. But the other work we're doing is we're gearing up for you all to come back. Uh, and we will be fully open. Our residence halls are getting staffed and we've hired the resident assistants that will be living on the floors and interacting and supporting our students who will be living on campus. Uh, the dining pavilion just behind me will be up and operating and ready to go, uh, as well as the Yabakov Wallace. They opened up this week and are starting to test out uh, and reopen the Yabakov Wallace Dining Center. So know that those spaces will be open and operating. Our staff will be back on campus to offer those in-person experiences, whether that's advising or meeting with someone at the Students First Center, um, our student clubs and organizations that do volunteer work in the community, as we work with our community partners, we know that those opportunities for you to still do that community engagement that you so do at, at high rates, uh, we'll be still doing that and working with our community partners to make that happen. Uh, a lot of our different clubs and organizations are already talking about where they will have meetings and how they will set up and structure those meeting environments in a way that continues to help people feel that we are mitigating risk uh, and taking into account some of those best practices coming out of the Center for Disease Control. Uh, we have a brand new conference center, which is on the other side of the lake, Ooh, right down there, uh, that actually has a huge ballroom in it that seats 900 people. So uh, we've got these opportunities now to think about where you might have your different clubs and organization events, as well as it's a beautiful day here in the Central Valley. You can do a lot of stuff outside still. Uh, and all of that is part of the way that we are being prepared to support you when you come back so that your student club and organization can do an outside event or, or have a meeting indoors at a place uh, that feels comfortable for you all. So just wanted to let you know all of that is some of the work that we're planning. The other thing that we're doing, believe it or not, is we are buying a bunch of inner tubes because during welcome week, we are planning to do inner tube water polo in our brand new pool, uh, as well as we might even do a float night movie night uh, for a group of students just to float. I, you, you know, I don't know if you've ever done it, floated in the inner tube in a pool while you watch Jaws or some really fun movie like that. Uh, these are these things that we are planning for you as you get ready to come back to campus and, uh, and really to support 
your um, connection to UC Merced, um, but also to make sure that you have access to some of those services, uh, in-person services. The one thing that we have learned is some of the things that we did this past year in a remote environment worked really well. Uh, and so we're looking at how do we continue to maintain some of those uh, and get some of that up and running and ready to operate. Uh, we had great success with over 500 different industry partners that zoomed in and met with our students and talked about the work opportunities that exist for them uh, at their different sites and different locations. So we know that that worked really well. And we may have more of those industry partners who continue to meet with our students through some type of remote environment. We also saw that we were able to get a lot of students together in one space and have great conversations, just like this webinar tonight. Uh, there are almost 700 of you that have joined in in a conversation tonight. We don't have a space on campus uh, where that might happen easily. Uh, and so the opportunities to do some of these interactions and to engage using webinar formats could be another great way that we can do that. We're also looking at extending some of our hours for services. So the Students First Center has been doing uh, late night opportunities for you to call in and get your questions answered. Uh, so we might be able to uh, transition some of those remote services to extend hours and opportunities for you to have access uh, to those resources. So all of that is part of the planning that we're engaged in, uh, but know that we are ready for you uh, and we are looking forward to that opportunity to see you physically back on campus or for some of you, uh, on campus for the first time as we meet and greet you and welcome you uh, to see all the really great spaces, uh, but more importantly, to breathe the life into UC Merced that you as our students bring uh, to all of these great spaces around me. So with that, I will turn it back over to my colleague, uh, uh, Executive Vice Chancellor Campfield, in case he has any final comments before we open it up to q and I'm just delighted that you talked about the pool. I mean, He's sitting outside in this heat. I, I'm inside in the air conditioning, so I had to put a jacket on. Um, but that pool is just going to be so much fun. And we've already did, just to let you know, we, um, we actually had a water polo tournament uh, with our local high schools uh, last week uh, in our pool, uh, just to test out all the systems to make sure it works. So uh, in case you're wondering, it works great. The scoreboard works great. Uh, and our local high schools were super excited to be on our campus and to, uh, to play their water polo match there. So with that, Ricky, we, I guess we'll turn it over to you to see if we have any questions that you can either uh, give all to Greg uh, or to see if we've got, <laughs> other, uh, we've got other colleagues that have joined us in the call that might be able to help answer some questions that folks have. Absolutely. Thank you both so much for that wonderful introduction. Great information regarding our return to campus in the fall. We definitely, again, want to welcome everyone that's been here. As Dr. Nice had mentioned, we have a great crowd. And because of that, we have wonderful questions coming in. So the first one I'd like to toss out, and let's start with Dr. Nice on this one. So will there be any type of quarantine that's happening as students return to campus? And I would direct that both not only if they're moving into housing, but also just for classroom access and that sort of thing. Is there any type of quarantine? Yeah, at this point in time, there is not a plan to do uh, a, a quarantine period, right? And so uh, for some of you that might recall this year before we started the academic year, students had to spend 14 days kind of quarantining before they were able to, uh, to kind of engage physically in the campus. Uh, that was before we really had set up a lot of our different testing protocols that we now have in place. Uh, and so we're able to, to do testing. And so our testing site and uh, and I know that uh, from our health center, Rosie Lopez has joined us today. Uh, she's been running the testing site. Uh, I was there today, spit in the tube, and I'll get my results tomorrow. Uh, so all of that is up and running so that those people that want to get tested, just to make sure we're able to do that. But our big anticipation, as uh, Provost mentioned, is that we are anticipating that the, the, the majority of our students will have been vaccinated before they even return to campus. The and faculty and staff as well as faculty and staff. Uh, and, uh, and so our students already have the opportunity to upload your vaccination information into your health portal. In the same way that you upload all of your other vaccines, uh, we've got it set up that you can already upload your COVID-19 vaccination information. Uh, and so we're gonna be pushing out uh, starting next week. We're actually, I'm gonna give you all the heads up. You, you all get insider information. Uh, we are going to uh, be doing a promotion uh, where we will be giving, putting uh, $20 on every student's uh, cat card to use in the campus store or in the Lantern Cafe uh, for those students that meet a certain deadline by getting their vaccine records up and running in the health system. Uh, if you've already done it, you get the 20 bucks. Uh, if you haven't done it yet, 
uh, and you do it in the next couple of weeks, uh, we'll, we'll give you 20 bucks on your CAC card. So, uh, uh, so you've got the insider scoop. Uh, and but we're going to be sending out that information. So uh, the reason why we won't be doing some of the quarantining before the semester starts is because we're anticipating the majority of folks will be vaccinated. Uh, as the provost mentioned, we do have places that are set aside so that if someone uh, does get uh, sick or test positive for, for COVID-19, we will have isolation spaces uh, be able to set aside for them to go into uh, as they get healthy uh, and recover, uh, as well as then our health center staff is up and running and ready to go to, to meet those needs. So. We do have the quarantine and isolation spaces set aside uh, to use in the event that we need to because someone uh, has tested positive. Wonderful, thank you for that. So we do have a follow-up. And actually, before we get started there, if I can ask all of our other expert panelists, if you can go ahead and go camera on screen with us and we will get this uh, kind of going as a gallery view. And then if there's a question that you'd like to answer, we can definitely direct that over to you. So the next question has to do with students and the requirement for them. And I would also say for staff and faculty, if we do need to start wearing masks when we first return, and if that standard will still be uh, in play after the June 15th deadline. We, we just don't know yet. I mean, I hate to say this, but that's been our life under COVID is that we just don't know. Um, probably not is my guess. And what, one of the things that, that folks may not realize is that the state sets out separate guidelines for institutions of higher education. Uh, and so those guidelines haven't come out yet based upon what we need to anticipate post June 15th. Uh, and so that's what we are still waiting on. Uh, so as the as was mentioned, we, we just don't know yet. Um, it doesn't mean that it still isn't a good practice for folks to, to wear face coverings, um, but we definitely outside, um, as we know, people who are vaccinated, according to the CDC, uh, will no longer need to, to wear them uh, outside. So we know that that will probably be a practice. Uh, it's whether or not inside some of the interior spaces, particularly our classroom environments, uh, that's where we don't know that the higher ed guidelines will will be shaped by the state and uh, and we anticipate hearing about those in the next couple of weeks right but when we're talking about indoor spaces we're talking about indoor public spaces in your in your room right you, you don't need to wear a mask correct Great, thank you so much for that. So another question that has become a hot topic here is do students who choose not to be vaccinated due to some type of moral or religious belief, will they still be allowed to attend their courses? Yes, um, we have that exemption because we um, believe in respect in people's faith traditions. Um, the assumption is most people will be vaccinated. And the, the point here is that um, the virus won't be transmitted unless there are enough susceptible people. And if we have a vast majority of people vaccinated, um, and, and that's true also of the people who can't be vaccinated for various health reasons, um, we're here to protect all of us. And so I think of it really much as a, as a duty to one another, as much as to ourselves. If we collectively have enough people who are immune through either vaccination or prior infection, then the virus won't spread. And that's our goal. Um, that's what I mean by, by at least as sa or safer than driving in a car. Now, there are risks we take. Um, these risks, we believe, will be very manageable when enough of us are um, willing to step up and be vaccinated. Yeah, I think that's an important point uh, that you made, right? That uh, I, I think. From my perspective, and, and obviously working with a lot of our faculty, as you mentioned, we've got great experts on our campus alone that study public health related um, issues. And from a public health standpoint, uh, that's really where the vaccination uh, comes from. And that's its, its strength is that it's really more from a public health standpoint than anything else as we uh, get vaccinated in an effort to really help protect our entire community. Uh, and we do it for the greater public good. Yeah, this is one of those things that um, talk to your grandparents and your great grandparents about. They'll remember polio. polio. And when the soft vaccine came out, um, I remember as a little kid being in the very long line of people outside of high school to get the vaccine. Now, mind you, as a, as a three or four year old, um, I thought it was great because it was a sugar cube with the, <laughs> with the vaccine on it. So to me, it was a treat. But uh, that memory is very vivid, how 
long the lines were because here was finally the solution, right? And people jumped at the chance and we eradicated polio um, collectively when we all jumped in to do it together. Well, we can do that with COVID too. Great, so we also have a lot of fun questions coming in about all the exciting events that we have on campus. So like Couchilla and Treats and Beats, et cetera. So can we touch on those a little bit? Do we still plan to have some of those exciting opportunities for our students? We absolutely do. Uh, really looking forward to what that might mean. Uh, for those of you that, that haven't been on campus recently, we have a brand new uh, recreation field uh, that we uh, just installed the lights on, which means we can use it at night as well. Uh, and the rec field was really designed to not only help support our, our recreation activities and in real sports and the like, uh, but also to do those evening concert events and activities. So we now have a nice great big space to do that. We tried it out uh, this, this fall. Uh, for those students who lived on campus, we set up a jumbo screen and we did an outdoor movie uh, and we gave them and we gave everybody free chairs uh, so that they could show up and get a free chair and then they all sat in the lawn and, and watched a movie and so uh, so we've got that field set up and ready to go and we plan on continuing to do some of those great UC Merced annual events, uh, such as treats and beats and Couchilla. Very good, thank you so much. So there's another question a little bit related to this in terms of whether something will be in-person or hybrid and that has to do with our Greek life. How will that type of programming take place this year for recruitment? Yeah, we anticipate that that uh, much like everything else will start to return to in-person activities. And so uh, uh, just as our, our clubs and organizations are excited about setting up tables along Scholars Lane, uh, we now have academic walk too, so it'll be interesting to see where folks set up the tables, uh, but we, we've got great spaces for that to be set up and happening. And so we anticipate uh, that our fraternity and sorority recruitment activities uh, will continue uh, in the way that they did kind of pre-pandemic. Uh, obviously we're mindful and we do everything a little bit different because we've learned uh, through this pandemic experience on, on, on kind of how we respond to each other and how we care for one another. So, so I think that will influence how we move forward, but they will still be all done in person. Very good. So let's move on to another topic with housing. So a question that has come in, do students get to pick where they're living or is there just a standard room based on how many roommates they choose to have? Hey, hi. Um, so room type, students get to choose room type. Uh, so they get to choose. We have very limited singles, but we definitely have a lot of doubles and a good number of triples. So those are the options the students get to choose in their housing application. Uh, once we move past that whole housing application and they sign the contract, um, and the, the next thing the students get to do is to, to participate in the roommate selection so they can choose a roommate based on the room type. So if you're in a double, you can choose another person as your roommate if you're in a triple you can choose two other people as your roommates very good thank you so much Wei Ling, and welcome to our event thank you so much for joining us so there is another housing question so if you can stay with us here for just a moment a question came in where they're stating that a lot of students are currently waitlisted for on-campus housing and they may not be able to afford off-campus options and so they're asking if there's any resource that we can offer them mm -hmm. to help them in that situation uh, let's see. I don't, I think, um, so for the email is housing at ucmerced.edu. The only students that are waitlisted, uh, are waitlisting on the waitlist, uh, there are students who are graduating in the fall semester. So what we try to do is we try to make sure the first year students and second year students uh, get housing and then third year students and fourth year students um, as of today, as far as I know, that all the students who wanted a whole year of housing have gotten offers to sign contracts. So definitely encourage students who sort of wonder why I'm waitlisted, uh, send us email and we will help you out with that. Hey, Ricky, can I uh, also add that uh, we do have off-campus housing services available. So um, if we can put into the chat, uh, Ricky, O-C-H, at ucmerced.edu. Mm -hmm. uh, that is how you can email one of the off-campus housing consultants to uh, get some advice, ask questions. They can also help uh, if you need help finding an, um, an apartment or a house off-campus. 
Um, just email your questions and someone will respond to you within 24 hours. Uh, we can also show you some uh, resources, uh, some websites and campus resources that will help you uh, choosing where to live off campus. And um, if you need questions like with a law clinic or anything else, um, should you have a problem with a roommate or a landlord? But um, yes, we have off-campus housing services available. Wonderful, thank you so much for that. And we do have that information that Wayling did drop into the chat. So if you are watching us right now and you do I want that information, you can go ahead and take a look in the chat and get that copy and pasted or take a quick screenshot so you have that for future reference. All right, so another question coming in related to housing. If we have parents of students who are bringing their students to us whenever they are getting ready to move in, do we have any type of partnership with local hotels for the parents to stay overnight? You got a couple, right? And so if you use the, if, you, if you're connected with UC, you can drop that uh, and there might be some discounts, uh, including our brand new hotel that just opened up downtown on Main Street. Uh, they've got the UC discount uh, at the El Cap Hotel. Uh, as well as um, we've got some relationships with both the Courtyard as well as the Holiday Inn Express. And so uh, just let them know that you're um, connected with the uh, University of California. Uh, we'll follow up just to make sure that they are prepared for you, uh, but, uh, but, but we've got that relationship set up. It, it's not, uh, uh, as Martin was saying, it's not formal, uh, but they do a, a UC discount. Wonderful, what a great opportunity for our families who are bringing their students, that's great. All right, so another question coming in and Wayling and Martin- I'll Ricky, talk I have to say that's one of my favorite days, move-in day. Um, it's like a giant party across the entire campus. It's just great. Absolutely, as I've always said, and I think everyone here will say this rings true for them as well. We definitely have a family atmosphere on our campus. So when we see you and we're welcoming you and you're coming you know, to campus to move here or just to go to classes or walk across the Scholars Lane Bridge, when we're there, we're clapping and smiling. That is so genuine. We're so thrilled that you're there. That's kind of what we live for on this campus. So definitely one of my favorite days as well. So another question coming in. So Wayling or Martin, if one of you can jump in, uh, I understand that the housing deadline has passed, correct? It was on June 1st. Is there any type of extension to that? Or what would you recommend if someone's still looking for an on-campus housing option? The, the housing application is open uh, because the, the transfer students are still applying. So officially we'll close on June 4th. Uh, so I would encourage that if you still look for housing, uh, please go into the housing portal and, and apply as soon as you can. Very good, thank you so much. So let's see, we have some questions coming in now for transportation and parking services. So would the Bobcat Express schedule be the same for spring uh, or as it was for spring 2021? Would there be more buses uh, for students who are living off campus? Good evening, yes, we are currently working on our bus uh, schedules for the fall semester and we will have um, full service ready for when you return. Very good. Thank you so much, Karen, and thank, and welcome to the event. Thank you so much for joining us. All right, let's take a look here. Other questions that are coming in. Will the study rooms be open on each of the floors in the housing facilities? Uh, yes, we plan on opening up all the common areas for the uh, fall semester. Very good. How exciting is this? Like everyone's going to be able to come back together. I'm so thrilled to be joining everyone back on campus and here in just a couple of months. All right. So coming in now with some more questions, let's move over to financial aid. So can we touch a little bit on federal work study positions and are those available for our incoming first year students? Yeah. Hi, Ricky. Hi. Um, <clears throat> work study uh, positions are available to all students that have completed a FAFSA application and have been awarded work study. Uh, we have a number of work study positions on campus uh, and a handful of work study positions that are located in our local community. Um, there are some tutoring positions with some local elementary schools, uh, but students are um, Students can view any of the positions that are available uh, for work study. Um, and the website is, I'll tell you right now, studentjobs.usmerced.edu. 
Great. Thank you so much, Heather, for that. And also welcome to our event. We will make sure that we drop that link into the chat so everyone can take a look there, take a, a quick screenshot or go ahead and visit that site for more information. And while we're with the topic of financial aid, um, Heather, can you also address the question of whether or not we still have opportunities available for scholarships for students? Uh, we do have some. Um, so for all incoming students, uh, we consider them for our scholarships um, using their admissions application and their FAFSA or DREAM application. Um, we have been awarding some scholarships, but not all have been awarded at this time. Uh, and then we uh, use an application process for our continuing students. It's our continuing students uh, scholarship application. It was available um, in uh, February of this year, and we have not awarded those scholarships yet. So over the next month or so, we'll be awarding scholarships to continuing students. Wonderful, thank you so much, Heather. At this time, I'd like to move over with our questions that are related to academics and course instruction. So if I can pass this one over to Provost Camfield, are there any hybrid or online options for students who either can't take them in person or just don't have an interest to right now? If they're still a little bit nervous for the in-person environment. We're not planning to do hybrid or online. Um, there will be, there always are a few options, a few courses available that way. Um, it's not general, <clears throat> excuse me, generally speaking enough to build out a schedule. Um, the Vice Provost and Dean of Undergraduate Education, Sarah Fry is here. Um, Sarah, did you want to add anything to that or did I cover it? I think you covered it. Um, yeah, we, we only will expect to have a very small handful of online courses. Students should not expect to be able to participate in the semester remotely. Very good, thank you. And the next question coming in, how will potential restrictions impact the classroom experience such as reduced classroom sizes? How large will lecture classes be or how small will the lab experiences be conducted so that they're safe? Well, again, what we're looking at right now is um, the assumption that there won't be significant restrictions on size. Um, we've been parsing this again and again every time the, the requirements for space change, um, but it really looks like most of our classes will be able to be as originally scheduled. As you know, we don't have that many really large lectures anyway, um, and the labs are, are appropriate for uh, the number of students that we'll have in them. So we're not gonna see much difference. It will be the pretty much the experience you were expecting. Very good, thank you. If I can have Wayling come back now, we also have a question regarding campus tours, but also specifically uh, dorm or residence hall tours. Are we still offering those? Uh, the student visitor centers have been offering those. Uh, so we've been working with one Roman from the visitor center. And so if you're interested, uh, I encourage you to go to the, we can drop that into student visitors uh, center website and you can sign up for those tours. Very good. And I will also just give a little bit of information. Just earlier today, a few hours ago, I was on campus and we were actually hosting some Instagram live tours, part of our new portion of campus and also an inside look into one of our actual residence rooms. So definitely take a look at our Instagram feed. The admissions account is at life at UC Merced. We also did a couple of those on the tours page on Instagram and their handle is at UC Merced tours. So definitely take a look there. While there, you might as well add us, right? So then you can make sure that you don't miss out on future opportunities. We do have future tours already scheduled. All right, so let's move on here to the next question coming up. So I will toss this one out to Dr. Neese or possibly someone who has joined us from the health office. Where can someone go to submit their health insurance waiver? And that's a great question. And, and Rosie is joining us from our student health center as well. And so Rosie, if I feel free to jump in and, and correct me if I don't get this right. But when you go into my, uh, go to the health center website, there is a link at the top that says my health. Uh, and you log in and that is a secure private space for you to go into manage kind of your health records uh, and, and that's where you would upload your vaccination records and we've already got it set up with the module in place for you to upload uh, your COVID-19 vaccination records. So uh, just to reinforce uh, that there will be and uh, there's an expectation that the COVID-19 vaccine will be mandated for all faculty, staff and students. Uh, so don't wait, don't hesitate, don't wait till the last minute. 
uh, go get that vaccine. And then you can upload it once you've got um, both of those vaccines in. Uh, so the moment you get that uploaded into that, that portal, uh, that fulfills that requirement. Okay, and for insurance, you would, um, if you wanna upload anything or send us a message on insurance, you'd go insurance at ucmerced.edu and we'll be glad to follow up on any question or concern you may have. Fantastic, thanks, Rosie. And, and, then, and I was just gonna add that, um, that we will anticipate that there might be some of our scholars that, that come uh, in August that, that haven't had access to the vaccine where they currently live. Uh, and so we, we will be prepared in our student health center to, to support those scholars that, that return to Merced area uh, and haven't gotten the vaccine. But, uh, but our anticipation is, is that the majority of our students will have already received it before August. Very good, thank you both so much for that. The next section, let's move over to dining services. So a question has come in, where does someone sign up for dining? And then we also have a follow-up of what types of uh, meal plan services and uh, cultural dining do we offer? Good evening, everyone. Kunal Sena here, Director of Dining Services. Such a great question. <clears throat> actually, I will let uh, my colleague Huiling, who actually helps us with uh, enrolling in the dining program, Huiling. When you sign your contract, one of the items that you do is you pick uh, your, your dining plan. So there's, uh, so there's this options of the minimum dining plan, unlimited, all you care to eat, 85, to the maximum unlimited, all you care to eat, 600. So the 85 means you get the $85 in your tech card, the 600 is $600 on your tech card per semester. So the, uh, the meal plan, the dining plan part is the same for every student. It's unlimited, all you care to eat. What that means is that you can go in the dining hall as often as you want, as you want, uh, but there is a 45 minutes gap. Uh, you know, 45 minutes you go in and then you, you have to wait another 45 minutes before you go in. Um, and then uh, it's a buffet style. So the students can choose all the options in there um, so that you can eat as healthy as you want with, you know, all the salad options, the food options, and the protein options and all that. I'm sure Puna can share a lot more about that with you. Yes, that would be wonderful if we can get a little bit more information as well in terms of what types of food that we actually offer. Absolutely. Here at UC Merced, we offer a wide variety of food um, options to all um, to everyone around the globe kind of cuisine we're offering here. Uh, luckily we are in the heart of Valley. So our, most of our produce are local. We try to connect with our local farmers and bring most of the product here. Um, right behind our dining hall, we also have Elizabeth Garden. We're actually working with our executive chef to grow our own peppers and uh, herbs and having those products to be used in our dining halls in the kitchen. Uh, we offer different varieties of vegan, vegetarian uh, protein options. Um, we, you guys can go online on our dining website and we also have our amazing uh, marketing uh, uh, social media page where we actually host a lot of uh, different events. Um, recently we had a burger battle and luckily <laughs> it was such a great time and actually our own culinary team came up with different menu options and our students were uh, invited to come and join us. Um, they went online and they did a poll. And after after getting that poll, we actually started featuring those menu products uh, in, in our menu. And we will have that in our cycle uh, rotation for on. And, and I have to say, I, I crashed the burger testing and, and came and had burgers. And so they were fantastic. So uh, uh, great job with the dining folks. Thank you. Definitely. Okay, so moving on, one more question here. What other types of food options do we have on campus? So as of right now, we have two dining facilities. As Charles was saying, you can see right behind him, we have a beautiful building called Pavilion Dining Hall. It's a, such a state of art kitchen we have. It's such a great view right behind the lake is. Um, we have uh, Pavilion Dining Hall, then we have YWDC. Dining Hall, which is the legacy of, of, of our campus, which has been catering the needs of the students for a long time. We just got the chance to open that one. And with the fall re, uh, reopening planning, and uh, we have a marketplace. We actually offers most of the 
retail content and we have Lantern Cafe, which is the cafe which offers all the baked goods. Uh, we have our own bakery in the campus, which actually produces some amazing cakes. And you can also go online and order some of those cakes for your loved ones or any parties, any, any farewells or welcoming anything, you know, having a birthday for your friends. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And I can definitely attest in my about six, almost seven years on campus, I think I've eaten at every single station. They're all phenomenal. Maybe with the exception of salads. I'm not much of a salad person, but all the rest, double thumbs up. <laughs> so let's move on to our next question here. Uh, will our library be open? When will that be available? The, the lantern is currently open and available. So students have been using the ground floor of that space. The, the cafe part isn't open, but the study space is open and available. Uh, and then Greg, I saw you were gonna jump in, but uh, as we look at getting ready to, to open up the rest of the campus, uh, particularly focused on July 1st, as we, we anticipate that the bulk of our staff will be returning uh, to on-site work, uh, that's when the, the library will start to open back up as well. Wonderful. At this time, I'd like to hand it over to one of my dear friends and colleagues, Lisa Perry from the Student First Center. Can you pop on and share a little bit about our checklist? Yes. So um, all students have a personalized checklist in their Connect account. And this is really your guide for being prepared to get your financial aid, register in courses, and complete any um, outstanding requirements that we need you to complete before starting the semester. The checklist is intuitive and it has lots of links to the forms and you can upload them directly to the tool. And it uh, the checklist updates as soon as you add those items to the requirement. Um, a couple of common questions that are coming in right now um, that might be helpful to everyone is the first one is about the health insurance waiver for uh, students who are not yet registered in classes that waiver item will not check off until you've actually registered in courses. So if you've completed the waiver and gotten an email saying you're approved, don't worry if it's not yet checking off your checklist. Once you get registered in courses, it should check off about three days after that. If it doesn't, go ahead and contact us and um, we will help you with that. And then another common one is uh, orientation registration for new students. Most of our orientation spots filled up the other day, which is very exciting, but we were able to open more seats. So I recommend that you get on and register uh, as soon as possible. And if you experience any problems, contact our orientation office and I'll put their contact information in the chat. I think those are kind of my best tips and tricks. And then I'll, I'll also put a video in the chat that you can link to um, that will help you kind of understand your checklist as well. Wonderful, thanks Lisa. All right, so just a quick reminder to everyone. I know we have so many wonderful questions coming in and we are getting close to our hour marks. We wanna be mindful of everyone's time this evening. If for some reason we haven't yet answered your question, there is a website. So do your part.ucmerced.edu. We'll make sure that we do drop that into the chat for you as well. You can take a look there for lots of other answers that are there. So just uh, keep in mind that we do have some other resources in case we haven't gotten to that question yet. This has also been a recorded event. So this will be made available later on as well in case you or your family would would like to go back and take some notes again or if you just happen to miss the full recording then you can go back and take a look at it then all right let's see here so i think at this time as we are as i mentioned getting close to that hour wrap up let's go ahead and go around and i will uh, first start with martin if you can give us some insight or just your personal feelings about how you're feeling about returning to campus uh, thank you ricky i'm excited to return to campus and see everyone my colleagues all the students and I'm really looking forward to uh, hanging out with everyone either at the dining center or at a, um, a rec and athletics uh, event, like um, when our sports teams play soccer or basketball or whatever is happening on campus. I'm really looking forward to all the campus events and just hanging out with everyone in the residence halls and on campus uh, for all the associated students events as well. Wonderful. Thank you for that. And now we're going to popcorn over to Lisa Perry. Share your Bobcat cheer. 
<laughs> well, I would say I am super excited about our new building and our new Students First Center lobby, where we are eager to help all of you. Um, it's a really warm and welcoming place. And I also recommend that if you have questions, ask us, don't be afraid, we're here to help. And we have lots and lots of ways that you can contact us. Like Charles said, we even have evening hours on some days and I'll put that information in the chat. Wonderful. And now I'd like to invite Scott to share what his Bobcat cheer is. What is most exciting to you in returning to fall? I'm looking forward to walking around the residence halls and seeing everybody in there hanging out and being in those common spaces again. We've been here the whole the whole year, uh, but we've missed you. So while we've been here, it's been kind of lonely. So I'm looking forward to having all 3,000 of you back. I'm needy that way. Here, here. Wonderful, thank you so much. And I will now toss it over to Erica Robbins. What is your Bobcat cheer? I'm really excited to be back on campus for a lot of the same reasons that Scott shared. I'm excited to be around students again. It's been great talking to folks on Zoom, but I miss those one-on-one -on -one interactions in the office and being able to give my students a high five or a hug when something goes exceptionally well. So I'm, I'm super excited. Wonderful. And Michelle, would you mind popping on and sharing what you're most excited about? Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Michelle Ropay, the director of the Bobcat Advising Center, and our team is busily preparing for almost 3,100 incoming first-year students. We are so excited to see you. For those of you who are our current first-years who just finished your first year, we wish we could have seen you in person, and we hope we will see you around campus when we're back on campus in the fall. But um, welcome to our incoming students and, and welcome back to our returning students who are coming back to campus. Wonderful. Thank you, Michelle. And let's go over to Brenda for one more. What is your Bobcat cheer? What are you most excited about? Hello, everyone. Um, I'm excited to be back and see campus in person, uh, visit all the new uh, buildings that have opened while we've been away um, and like Erica shared, just really interacting in person with students um, and engaging like we used to before. So really excited to be back. Wonderful. Hi. And Carla, let's toss it over to you. Hi there, Carla Gonzalez, School of Engineering. One of the things I'm excited about is Welcome Week. So I'm hoping that we'll have great events happening there to welcome you all onto campus and just look at your bridge crossing, which is always fun. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for sharing your Bobcat cheer. I know that we all just have very full hearts and I'm watching our little side chat with colleagues behind the scenes and we're all just so thrilled that you could join us this evening. A wonderful turnout. All of these expert panelists answering questions behind the scenes as well as live here and you can see all of our smiling faces. We're so thrilled to hopefully be able to see you and meet you in person in just a short couple of months. So we do have a website that we just want to mention and we will place it in the chat as well. And so that is doyourpart.ucmerced.edu once again. And also a quick reminder, this has been recorded and will be made available at a later time. And all of the unanswered questions, if we didn't quite get to yours because we had so many come in that were so wonderful, we will be getting back to you via email. So please don't feel left out. There was just so many coming in and we did the best we could to reach everyone, but we will not forget to reach out and get your question answered. If, if I could say one last thing here. So I've taught at many universities. Um, I did my graduate work at, at Berkeley. Um, so I did teaching there, I'm mostly freshmen, but you know they were great students. I had my first academic position at an Ivy League university, great students, but the best students are the ones here. I think when, when you get here, if you're new to the campus and you spend time with your peers, you'll realize what a special place you all make it. And as a, a faculty member and now administrator here, I have always felt that it's an honor to work with the extraordinary students here at UC Merced. Um, so um, welcome back. It's gonna be great to have you all um, marching up and down the, the walks and in the classrooms and bubbling around with your amazing enthusiasm and resilience. Um, we're really excited to have you back. Charles? Fantastic. Thanks, Greg. And uh, a, a couple of things that I want to say as we wrap up, I, I think as I look across uh, my 
my Hollywood Square screen in front of me of all of these amazing people that, that have joined us tonight. I just wanna make sure that you all as scholars recognize uh, this incredible group of individuals that are supporting you uh, and are cheering for you uh, and are right there uh, to, to serve and, and, and help and support you as you move forward in your academic journey and your academic success. Uh, and so I'm super excited that uh, this rock star group of folks uh, have come online tonight to, to be part of this conversation. Uh, and I hope you all as scholars recognize the incredible support that they bring and they provide to you. Uh, and as mentioned, please reach out to all of us or any of us and ask those questions that you might have as you think about returning uh, physically or coming to campus for the first time uh, in August. We're, we're super excited to support you and to support your journey. Uh, I too uh, have to echo what, uh, what Greg mentioned about the opportunity to work with the scholars that are at UC Merced. I uh, have taught at and worked at other institutions. Uh, I am super excited. I'm gonna be teaching again in the fall. Uh, and I'm super excited. No. I'm super excited to be back in the classroom, Greg, uh, and the opportunity to connect with scholars in, in that learning environment, uh, but also the opportunity to just well, walk across campus and to, to say hi to you or to, uh, as was said, see the energy uh, as you accomplish uh, those things that, that you do here at UC Merced. And so uh, I'm really looking forward to that and to celebrating with you and your families uh, and all of that journey. Uh, as a first generation college student myself, uh, my parents really didn't have a lot of sense of, of, of why I kept wanting to come back to campus. Uh, but the more that they experienced and learned about that journey that I was on and were part of that, uh, that journey as well and supported me, um, they really recognized uh, the role that going to college played in my life. And so uh, I'm super excited for all of the family members that have joined the call tonight as well. As you learn more about that, your scholar's journey, uh, and who the, the amazing people are at UC Merced that will be supporting them and encouraging them throughout their career. So uh, super excited. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, I, I said earlier when I logged on, you know, people will be able to kind of see the sunset across my face uh, as I sit outside here on our campus. It's a beautiful night at UC Merced. Uh, there's a bunch of geese behind me that are starting to honk and, uh, and make all of their noise. Uh, and so we welcome you to come back and join uh, the beautiful surrounding that is UC Merced, but more importantly, to be part of this Bobcat community uh, and to feel the energy that is part of UC Merced. So with that, thank you again for joining us. Uh, have a fantastic night and go Bobcats. <laughs>